Hey, everybody. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of Our Kids Play Hockey. We want to let you know that we have once again been honored with a nomination for the Hockey Podcast of the Year via the Sports Podcasting Awards. And all you need to do to help us is go to OurKidsPlayHockey.com and click on the Vote Now button. It asks you a couple questions. You're in and you're out, and you have voted for us for Hockey Podcast of the Year. I want to thank you all for being a wonderful, wonderful audience and helping us get to this stature of hockey podcasting because we've done it as a family, as the hockey friends and families around the world. Thanks so much and enjoy this episode of Our Kids Play Hockey. Hello, hockey friends and families around the world, and welcome to another edition of Our Kids Play Hockey. This is a signature edition. What do I mean by that? My two co-hosts, Christy Casciano Burns and Mike Benelli. If you're watching, you can see them right now. They might look a little bit quizzical. If you're listening, you can't see that, but I'm trying to add inflection to my voice. It's going to let you know that because they don't know what we're going to talk about today. Only I, Lee Elias, knows today's topic, and I'm going to share it with them now. As I said, this is a signature episode. And we've been on the air for a long time, guys, well over a year now. And I realized we have actually never done an episode ever where we tell people who we are and what we do. And I thought it might be time to officially introduce ourselves to our audience. So this might not be a super hockey centric episode, but it's kind of like a, hey, meet the hosts, meet the hosts, meet the hosts. You know, I got Christy laughing. because I was scared there for a minute the way she was looking at me. But no, I did. I wanted to dive in today and, and really just talk about a little bit more like who we are kind of behind the scenes. Cause I really, we just, we don't, we're just three people talking hockey every week. Um, and we have lives <laughs> and I wanted to, uh, to explain that. And I, I, the reason I didn't tell you to uh, this is because I have great admiration for both of you uh, actually extreme amounts. Um, and I wanted to be able to share that with the audience without you guys preparing for it uh, in, in one way or another. And, and Christy, I'm going to start with you uh, because I, for those of you who don't know, uh, Christy is a trailblazer in, in many different ways. Uh, she has been working in television news since, I believe, 1986. Is that correct? Um, she has won many awards. She is a staple up in Syracuse, New York. I was uh, blessed to go visit her when we released our book. Um, and it was like the whole community was her family. Everybody knew who she was. People coming up to her, stopping her at Starbucks. Saying, Are you Christy Cash? She says, yes, I am. It was really beautiful, actually. Um, and then on top of it, you have just really served your community. Of course, this is on top of being a hockey mom, a mom of two, a loving wife, which we'll, we'll get into. But Christy, again, I said this, a trailblazer because uh, you're a female anchor. Uh, you know, you, you have always been humble about that. But I'm amazed as someone who was trained in broadcast journalism at, at what you've accomplished, how you accomplished it, and the person that you are in that community. Uh, so I, I mean that as a compliment, but... I, would, I want you to tell the audience, if you're okay with it, just how you got into news and, uh, you know, how you got to the place you're at, because it is amazing to me. Now that I'm 20 shades of red, thank you very much. <laughs> I think it, well, for those of you listening, you can't see that, but thank you for admitting that. <laughs> I, I don't like talking about myself. I know you do. Um, <laughs> so, but I, um, ask me a question. I'll ask you a question. Okay. Tell me how you got into the news industry at a time period where honestly women were not in news, right? In the, in the mid eighties, that was not something that was, was readily available. And then maybe tell us about your trip up to anchor because that is a prestigious uh, position to be in. And you serve a major city in New York. I do love what I do. I have a great passion for it. Um, and it all started with my love for writing when I was a kid. And I discovered the big silver microphone at my dad's grocery store. I was a cashier. And when he finally allowed me to make the announcements in the store, something came over me. <laughs> it felt amazing to be able to grab that microphone and make announcements in this grocery store and everybody paid attention to what you were saying. And I was kind of a shy little kid. I was not super popular in school. I was kind of a chunky kid and I got bullied a lot because of my weight. And all of a sudden I discovered that people were finding me important when I made this announcement. And then I got a little um, kind of crazy with that microphone. For example, there was an egg spill in aisle six. I mean, it didn't just, most of the cashiers would say clean up in aisle six and be done with it. 
I went into great descriptions. There's been a catastrophic egg spill <laughs> in aisle six. We need three people on this immersive cleanup. And there are three cars with their lights on in the parking lot. And I would give, and my dad would laugh. He just thought it was so funny. And he said, you know, you got a really good voice and you're very descriptive. You ought to think about going into radio or television. And boom, light bulb went on. We had this fantastic school, Syracuse University's new house school, the premier school in the country for broadcasting. Uh, that was my only choice. And when I applied, I got accepted and trained to be a journalist and just fell in love with it. Um, one of my favorite television stations growing up was News Channel 9. We would watch it every night. My dad would have the news on. And that was our thing. We watched the news together. And he said, that'd be really cool if you could work for Channel 9 someday. So I applied for an internship. I got an internship, started working in radio. Uh, my first job was in Rochester after I graduated from Newhouse. And then um, the news director at the time worked with me in radio, brought me back, and I couldn't wait to get started in, um, in Syracuse and, and be a part of the community and give back to the community that gave so much to me. Um, the rest is history. So I, I did every job at the, at the TV station. Um, Anchoring, reporting, producing, I did a little shooting, uh, everything. So now I'm the main, the main, like I hate talking about myself. You're doing great. Now I, You're doing great. Now I'm the main anchor and I'm um, very proud. And we lead a great team of reporters and journalists. And during COVID, it was exhausting. The, the news wheel was spinning so quickly and there were no guidelines guy rails right. at that time and at that point I felt this is the most important time of my career and um, just going into work every day when no one else was there <laughs> was challenging and delivering news that was just so heartbreaking but I knew it was important to do that so um, yeah just a, a reader's digest for oh you version. did great you did great. <laughs> First off, thank you for saying that. I hate talking about myself. I know you do. Let's and talk I want, about hockey, listen, please. I'm going to tell you this. That, uh, obviously, this is the story before hockey ruined your life. But I want everybody yeah. to know that, uh, <laughs> no, Christy, I really appreciate that. I know that I know you don't like to do that, but I will tell you that you did it great. And uh, look, I like hearing that. I'm sure the audience likes hearing it too. You know, a few things. First off, that's like the most American story you can get. And I love <clears> that. <throat> uh, the next thing I was going to say too is that, you know, uh, you and I have had a lot of off camera discussions about national news and where national news is we're not going to discuss it now but i've always said to you and i mean this that local news still is extremely valuable and extremely uh looked upon probably with a lighter light maybe than than agenda-led news that's what i'm going to say um and i have always loved about news i, I mean i really like my my i had a lot of heroes growing up outside of my parents and my brother um some of them were you know most of them were military obviously and i, I love athletes but I, I admired news anchors. I grew up loving the Edward Morrow and the ability to inform people and the importance of that. And you do that on a daily basis. And um, I, I just think that the fact that you're able, uh, let me rephrase that, the fact that people in Syracuse, New York and, and surrounding areas invite you into their living rooms every night, right? And you get to be a part of their family. And that's why people come up to you like they know you, right? Like, oh, Christy, I know you, you're on the team you don't know them but they know you <laughs> and i yeah. love that and it, that that is one of the most amazing services and it is a service people that christy provides to her neighborhood and obviously news anchors around the country do that but um i your story inspires me christy and I, i'll tell you what it, like it, it, like it builds me up to the way you even started with the microphone in uh in the store it's it's funny because i had a similar one I, I did the announcements in my high school Right. And I was a very eccentric kid. And I said, why don't we put Lee on the mic? And I, I used to play music every morning for the kids. And I got into radio because of that. So um, similar stories there, but I love what you do. I love who you are. Um, and, you know, I'll tell you what, one of the things we actually never acknowledged on this show, you talked about being a news anchor during COVID. Uh, you did this show every week as well during that time, uh, which I, again, we joke, I think was therapy for all three of us <laughs> right. with, with things were going on, but 
Uh, let, let's skip out of the news, get you a new comfort zone, talk about at least the hockey side of your life. I joked about before it ruined your life. Obviously, I was being sarcastic. Uh, yeah. But uh, again, we talk about your kids all the time and your husband. Just tell us about your family real quick. And yeah. And, and so, you know, again, the Reader's Digest version, if you will, right. of Christy Cassiano. My husband is a um, retired Syracuse police detective sergeant, um, did it phenomenal work for SPD, did a number of um, undercover investigations. Um, there was a huge um, investigation that he was part of with gangs and, and, uh, very uh, violent times and he uh you know he he's just amazing just an incredible detective and i have to be careful because he's listening now <laughs> <laughs> well no one's gonna mess with you if, if he does and anything to like, you, you you let us know because we're not gonna he, do anything boy, he, he figures things out way ahead of time before he's he's really very intuitive which is he's so impressive and smart one of the smartest men i've ever known um our kids started playing hockey, not because we wanted them to play hockey. I was a figure skater, so I couldn't wait to get them on the ice. And I got them into figure skating, my son um, first. And um, he gravitated toward hockey because his cousin played hockey. Once he picked up his stick, he never put it down, never looked back. So all of a sudden I found myself immersed into this crazy world. I felt like I was dropped onto a foreign planet. People were speaking languages I didn't understand and playing this brutal game and they smelled and there was so much <laughs> to it. It's like, what do you mean? You have, you have no weekends. You, there are no Saturdays and Sundays during this season. Now that's when you play. What do you mean I have to get them up at 5 a.m. for ice? It was crazy. I just thought it was insane. Um, but I felt quickly fell in love with it and learned everything. And that's one of the things about our family too, is once we start something, we're into it. We're all in and we learn as much as we can. And we're like little sponges. We like to absorb as much as we can learning the history and just everything, every little part, just to be successful at being hockey parents and raising our kids and enjoyable experiences. We never pressured them to play. It came from inside of them. Uh, we never pushed them in that direction at all. It was, they couldn't wait. In fact, with my son, uh, he was born during Super Bowl Sunday. So I thought he was destined to be a football player. And I put him in football. He didn't like it one bit. He was kicking and screaming to practice. And I put him in karate. And we exposed him to basketball and baseball. He never really enjoyed any of those. But with hockey, he was the one who said, mom and dad, hurry up, get ready. I don't want to be late. I don't want to be late for breakfast. So he, he had that passion and then little sister just followed along and she wanted to be exactly like big brother. I did get her into some figure skating shows and they didn't last very long. We even did a show together, which was really fun. But her, she just fell in love with hockey too. And she took it all the way. She's playing college hockey. So that's, that's the kind of passion that she has. Um, do I have any regrets? None at all. Yeah. I've met incredible friends, friends for a lifetime. I even just had a lunch last week with a bunch of our, our hockey mom friends. And um, we text each other all the time. We're, that supportive network never goes away. It's with you for life. Um, so, and that's, that's the thing I think people forget. They get so wrapped up in, you know, your kids succeeding at the sport and, oh, they have to, you know, go to college, you have to play college hockey. Don't forget about all the fringe benefits that you get because they're much more valuable uh, long-term and uh, rewarding for your life. So yeah, it's been a great ride. I love it. I'll tell you to your son and your daughter, old, older siblings always lead the way and they don't That's realize, true. they don't realize they're doing it. And it, 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 you know, my older brother led the way for me. So, so good on your kids for that. And uh, last thing, and Mike, this is kind of your two-minute warning, Mike. You're up next, so get, get all your blushing out now. Christy, I really appreciate you doing this. Um, I'm also happy that I'm thousands of miles away because I could see you throw a book at me when I brought the topic up in your mind, and I was like, I ducked out of the way. But um, speaking of books, <laughs> speaking of books, Christy, you penned a few books. You're a writer. Um, you know, what's oh, funny yeah. about this audience is that uh, they probably know you more as USA Hockey Magazine's hockey mom than maybe an anchor in Syracuse, New York, which I think is pretty funny, but... Christy has been an avid writer uh, monthly for USA Hockey Magazine for a long time. 
Uh, it also created the book behind her. If you're watching my kids play hockey, which this podcast is aptly named after and inspired by uh, amongst the other books that you've written, obviously the puck hog books, and you've written other books outside of hockey too. So let's just talk about you as an author for a minute, because uh, again, it's like, there's no stop to what you do. You're just incredibly creative and, and it's wonderful. And I want to hear about the, the writing side, how you even got into that. You said you started as a writer as a young kid. Did that blossom into this today? Yeah, and, and my sister's a fantastic illustrator. And when we went on family trips, I would write stories about the trips and I give my sister the stories and she would um, illustrate <laughs> them. And it was, it was really fun. So we had that neat relationship. <laughs> this is my first children's book, The Puck Hog. And that was based on real life experiences with watching my kids play. And there was one season where there was a kid who was just incredibly talented, way, way ahead of all the other kids and scored all the time. And um, the kids just weren't having fun, you know? Um, they were winning, but they weren't really enjoying the season because everything was focused on the star <laughs> who didn't like to pass. Um, so I, I got inspired to write a book about the importance of teamwork and that putting the emphasis on winning all the time can really deflate a season. Um, and my, so I wrote the story. I <laughs> got my sister to illustrate. I mean, look at that. Yeah, she, awesome. yeah. yeah. she used pencil because she wanted kids to get inspired to, um, be creative and you don't have to use computers and graphics to create beautiful work but just a simple pencil what would she do with that pencil um i i took the story to the syracuse crunch and uh jim sorosi from the crunch fell in love with the story and he said you know we'll do whatever you can if you get this published um we would love to support you so that's why it's it's crunch themed as well so we have a lot of success with that and um all around the country people were responding to it oh my gosh my kid went through the same thing there's a puck hog on the team and it's really not the way to go and the coaches are putting them in all the time because they want to win <laughs> but the kids aren't having fun playing so um this really was a great motivator for a lot of kids who would read it and see themselves as the puck hog or see someone who they played with as the puck hog there's some really good mechanisms in here on how to deal with that um so after that book did really well we had a trip to lake placid and it was incredible so the second book we decided to base on the, uh, our own miracle on ice with Lake Placid is the thing. And uh, it was so much fun to write because I took the kids on kind of a fun journey and I wanted to also have, you know, some mystery in there. So there's, we threw a ghost in there. And this is Jim Sorosi's kid. My sister um, took a picture of, of little Holden Sorosi scoring and she created that. And um, Jim was just, and he was blown away. He's like, oh my gosh, that's Holden. And he'll forever be eight years old. <laughs> so it was great. Um, when uh, Harry Thompson, who is the editor of USA Hockey Magazine, was searching for someone to write for the magazine, um, he somehow stumbled upon my blog because he started blogging too. And he reached out to me and he said, you know, we're trying to give the magazine, you know, a fresh coat of paint and we're looking for someone and at the time Sophia was eight years old so you know we're going back 10 years um <clears throat> we're looking for someone to write from the trenches because we we want to give people like what's it like out there you know how are you dealing with traveling and expenses and do you have any um tips for other hockey parents and it's like yeah I got a ton of them you want someone in the trenches I am in the trenches. <laughs> so I gave him a sample article. He really liked it. And he said, we, we'd like to hire you. So I started writing for USA Ho Hockey Magazine. We come up with things. Um, and a lot of times I'll pitch ideas based on what our teams were experiencing uh, and hearing from other hockey parents. And all of a sudden, this huge network of hockey families grew. And I would tap them. Uh, I would, you know, write to my contact in Alaska and say, hey, 
what are you guys dealing with? Or down in Texas and in the Midwest, uh, all these families were all of a sudden leaning toward me for um, advice and say, you should do this article or, you know, we just had this issue with bullying on our team. Can you write an article about that? All of a sudden it just blossomed. So it's been really fun connecting with hockey parents all over the country and writing these articles. Um, and I'm really appreciative of having the opportunity to just share what it's like as a little hockey parent from Syracuse, New York. And it's amazing how many people can relate to what we all go through. It's, it's so many common things. Um, yeah, we should make a podcast it's, about it's it. It's kind of a cool thing, hockey community. So my sister yeah. is such a, I gotta give her one more plug. She just Please. drew this. Uh, she, it's a graphic novel and it's called Sand. And it's just amazing. So that's what a talented artist she is. So when you get these books and you put them in the hands of the kids, you're going to be treated to some incredible artwork that will just blow you away. That's fantastic. Yeah, I love my sister, the, those books, those, yeah, those books were those books were so great she, for me gr growing up because I mean not me growing up, but me with my kids as they were growing up because you know not they're easy to read and they're 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 fun to follow and i think they are relatable i think just like your articles and a lot of stuff you're doing they're 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 relatable to really anybody in the sport and i know we gave them i still to this day get comments from it was probably about the same time what it was at least uh, 8 years ago right that we did the puck hog gifts to all those little bedford bear kids these parents still have those books they guarantee they don't they they don't have the little trophy or the medal they hang around the neck but i guarantee they have those books sitting in the kids room still they're great Christy, Thank also, you that, your, your sister, that. and you recently did another book, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> uh, no, this obviously we're plugging the book here, but but um, this was Do one I. of my. I'm, no, I, I, I want to say this. I'm, I'm, for those of you listening, I'm holding up when hockey stops uh, again. The book that that Christy and I wrote together. Uh, Christy, I'm going to say this, and I, I've said it before. Writing this with you was one of the greatest creative joys of my entire life. I am not. I am not exaggerating that because we're on the air. Um, uh, the, the the speed number one at which this came together. But the joy that I had writing this and then then the excitement of jumping on the phone with you to like edit and work on it was was one of the greatest creative ventures of my life. Uh, Mike, that takes nothing away from you in this podcast. I was saying when you were talking, Christy, about the USA Hockey Magazine, someone should do a podcast about being in the trenches <laughs> with other hockey, hockey parents. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, for the, maybe for the, the, many of you don't know this, but this podcast is based on Christy's writings. Um, and again, the book, My Kids Play Hockey, which is really a collection of, of several articles, if I'm not mistaken, um, that was the basis for this. And I remember when we started the show, Mike, uh, I remember, Christy, you go, are we going to have enough topics? And I picked up her book. I said, well, I've got about 80 in this book we can pick from and just talk about one of these at a time. And in and, and the early episodes, that's what we did. We just kind of kind of paged through the book and, uh, hey, this is a good one for today. And then it evolved into something, obviously, beyond that. Um, right. which we're thankful for all of you out there. Christy, uh, that concludes. This is your life. You did a wonderful job. Wonderful get job. Get to know me. Remember, <laughs> you, you both, if you want, will get the chance to interrogate me at the end of this episode. Uh, otherwise, I'm just going to dive into it. Uh, but honestly, I want the audience to hear about you two because uh, because amazing lives here. So Christy, first off, thank you for sharing. Really, I, 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 as I said at the top of the episode, I did spring that on her. And if you had something to throw at me, you would have done it, but you didn't. And I appreciate that. Um, my last, my, yeah, right. My last note on Christy, and this is something I love, is uh, when I was up with it, two things, actually. When I was in Syracuse with her, a lot of people don't know this, but, you know, as broadcasters, you have a news voice and you have your normal voice. And it's, it's the same person. It's just amplified in different ways. Christy doesn't become somebody different when she's on the air. But I was sitting next to you at the radio station and we were talking like this and they cued you and you switched into anchor voice. <laughs> instantaneous uh and, and again I, I i've never seen you do that we were talking like this she's like today in syracuse new york i was like whoa that was a pro move that was like watching gretzky on the ice playing i was like that was amazing um, but but christy the thing i'll remember the most is the warmth that you shared with other people but that they shared with you you are beloved in that city and it's so warming to see Thank especially you. now especially now after everything that's kind of happened that that you you that you could feel it you could just feel wow people love you and you love them back it, and and it's really just how it's just supposed to be i said it's an american story um you know that was that was my biggest takeaway not just signing books with you 
Um, that was beautiful. All right. Thank you. Nope. Thank, Thank you. you. All Thank right. You. We're going to sauce the it, puck Mike. over to the Benelli man. Okay, Bag Mike, listen. It. Let me introduce I'm Mike not. Benelli. <laughs> and I'll introduce you. Now Mike's blushing. I love it. This is, this, this is why I didn't tell you guys what we were talking about. Um, let me tell you why I admire Mike. Uh, Mike is a man and a human being. He's a father. He's a husband uh, who has dedicated uh, his life really to helping others through the game of hockey. And it's not just players, it's administrators, it's coaches, it's everybody. And I'm not going to lie to you. The reason I admire you, Mike, is because that's an incredibly hard position to be in. And you, you, you do it somewhat, somewhat relentlessly. Um, now, let me define that again for the people listening. I want you to think about everyone you've ever met in your hockey organization, everyone. And I want you to think about, you know, how much friendship you create, but also how much stress comes from that. And this is, if you ever read the book, The Giver, about a man who takes in everything and, and compartmentalizes feelings, uh, Mike is kind of that in the hockey universe. And, and it's an undying passion that he has for the game. Um, Mike, for someone in my position, that's incredibly inspiring. All right. Because there, you know, like, there's days in the game I go, oh, man, this is just tough. And I look at, I say, look, if Benelli can do it, I can do it. Or as Christy would say, if Benelli can do it, I can Benelli. do it. Yeah, she will say Benelli. But <laughs> like, let, let's, start, let's talk about this because you do have a history in the game. Uh, and I'm, like, I'm, not exact, I'm not asking you to give me your hockey resume, but just talk to uh, me about like, you know, how you fell in love with this game because to, to do what you do, it's not a common passion. A common passion is going to Madison Square Garden, you know, yelling at other people, hoping the Rangers win and going home. You know, you, this is something that's 24-7 for you. Yeah, well, and thanks. I mean, I I I don't know if uh, a, a giver is always uh, the best way to describe you know what I do, but I think well only because I because honestly I don't even think about it that way because I get so much from all the different relationships right, I get course, from of course. from all these player people and and my own kids and my families and the people I get involved in and I I really do try to branch out out outside of hockey. I mean, my whole. I, it's funny it like tries. like hockey, yeah and, and hockey is like, it's funny because hockey is like not even like number one if you ask me like what are your passions i don't know if hockey would be me my first passion but but it, it is the way it's the easiest way i found to connect with people and connect like the things that i love and the things that i like to do so and i think a lot of it stems from you know obviously my parents and my father was, right. was number one because he was a big hockey fan you grew up in the bronx he, he used to sneak into the old madison square garden you know and tickets or five cents a piece or whatever it was, you know what I mean? Like all that kind of stuff. And, and um, you know, it wasn't, wasn't a hockey player. It was a roller roller guy, you know? So I, I, and I, and I get, I started skating actually a little bit like little skaters uh, in uh, Riverdale ice skating center down in the Bronx. And, but I never played hockey. I don't know why, you know, I, and even then hockey was expensive. It wasn't cheap. Right. So we never, you know, my father was a professional commercial artist. He probably worked, you know, worked crazy hours down the city and, you know, my mother, I'm one of, I'm the oldest of five children. So, you know, who, who had time for hockey. Right. And so I grew up at this place called the Kelton's ice skating center, which uh, Alana Kelton was the skating coach and Robbie Kelton was the manager. And I would work around the rink, like sweeping, cleaning, following this guy around all day. Um, and, but my first, so I think I never got involved with hockey because the biggest hockey that was down at Kelton's ice skating center and for those listeners, I'd love to hear at some point if you ever went to these games, but it was always the police firemen, like the police athletic league games. And think about this back in like the seventies, it was nuts. Like there was no <laughs> hockey. It was all fights. It was boxing. Brawls. Yeah. It was hard. It was, horrendous. you went to a like fight I, and a hockey game broke out. It was, that's, it was, it was right. just like, it was literally back in the seventies of just, the broad street bullies versus the, you know, you know, it was just horrible. It was, it was not, it was not a sport. I think most people would bring their kids to see and then say, Oh yeah, that's something I want my kid to do. So we moved up from the from, from the Bronx to a uh, beautiful Westchester County up in the country with the country back then was a real country. And uh, I started. So my first time I got on the ice was at the Harvey school in Katona. I was 11 going on 12 and uh, got on the ice with the chair, you know, back in, you know, you put the kids on the, on the, on the chair from the lounge. And I think within five seconds, my father's like, okay, get him off the ice. Let's go. Let's get <laughs> out of here. This is not for him. Cause every kid, you know, all at 12, 11 years old, everybody's playing hockey. Like those kids are skating around, they're doing the thing. And, and I'm like, no, no, this is just not going to work. So let's get him off the ice. He can't even stand up. And so it was really, so I was really so lucky. And I think because, and the reason I'm doing what I do now, if I really think about it, it was because of the people that supported me like right at that time, 
Like my father really didn't give up on me. All the coaches that were on the ice were like, what the hell? He plays baseball, football, basketball. Let's, let's go. We can, this is easy. Like we'll get it. And then uh, I think that summer I spent. So again, it was like kind of being around a rink, rink rat type of stuff. Started working at the rink, cleaning up, cleaning up the locker rooms. I used to scrub, I used to scrub the boards. This was before the, 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 you know, I used to, with a Brillo pad, a bucket of water, and I would sit on a little bench and I would scrub the puck marks off the boards. That was my summer job at, at 12 years old. And, but my, and, the, and the payoff was I got to skate anytime I wanted. So if I was there and, and the figure skaters got off the ice, I would I'd put my skates on and I'd skate. And I made the, uh, and I made our, our, at the time, it would have been Bantams, our Bantam A team, the, the, the next year, you know, that next September. And, you know, was I good? No, I never, I never really had that the skill, right? So I just worked hard and, and I got to play in high school. I got to play in college. I got to go, you know, I, after, after that, I was really passionate about coaching. I think I've always been, had a, had a, have, I definitely have a soft spot for kids that are late bloomers and not the stars. I used to hate the stars. Like that was like when I was 12 and 13, I just hated watching it. Even in college, I hated watching guys that played that was easy for them. I just hate, you know, just like, what do you mean? You, you know, you could do that. You don't have to do anything. Like you don't ever work out. You just come and play. Yeah. I'm just good. I'm like, and I used to hate that. So um, I really definitely grad, you know, gravitated towards the kids that, uh, that, you know, that, that have passion and wanted to learn. And, and I, and I hope that that's how I present every day. So I started, you know, I started coaching in high school and prep school. I coached in college for a couple of years and then started building rinks around the country. One of them being down New Jersey there and Montclair state university, Westchester skating Academy, Danbury Ice Arena, Waterville Valley, New Hampshire. You know, so I started building these rinks and getting involved. And eventually I got to the point where like, like I really like what I'm doing and I, and I think I'm pretty good at it. And I just started branching out and that's what I do now. I, I basically, I'm, I'm, I, I branch out and I help other organizations uh, not, not make the mistakes that I, and I certainly made all of them, you know, ordering the wrong size jerseys for kids and, you know, you know, you show up at a rink, you know, five hours away and there's no game and uh, you know, little things like that, <laughs> you know, all the, well, you know, Christy, you know, Christy knows like, you know, go, go, having, trying to have international hockey schools and, and working on logistics and payments and coaches and, you know, making sure everybody's having uh, you know, the, in the customer service world, a, a great, a great experience. And so I do, I do uh, the hockey side of what I do is, you know, really, what I what I enjoy the most, probably because it's the easiest for me. Um, you know, my wife's a, a licensed clinical social worker, so she fits right into what I need. You know, when I go home, and uh, <laughs> and uh, and then I have, you know, and then and then I think just because of the way our podcast is is formulated, you know, I have, I have and, and people will understand this from the hockey world, and we do right that I have an 07 year birth and a 2013 year birth, so you know where they fit in in the hockey world. And, uh, and I've been, and again, I've been coaching. It's so funny that you, you, you're bringing this up because I just had to fill out a, I had to fill out a survey. <laughs> I had to fill out a survey for, um, you know, the, uh, the, the NHL coaches conference. And one of the things they do is they start surveying you like, okay, well, what, what do you coach? You know, all, uh, all these different things like, oh, what level are you coaching? You know, what level do you coach? That kind of stuff. And like, I literally can't do like my check boxes is every box. Right. I can't, I, I, I basically work with NHL players. I work with junior players. I work with midgets and, and bantams and 15 U. I work with, and I work with the, you know, learn the play players. Right. Um, Mike in the business world, we call people like you an asset. Or, or, and, and most people in my business call me half of that. So yeah. <laughs> I, I say, so, so I, <laughs> so, so I, I, I think that, you know, and, and again, I, and I'll get those questions like, oh, you, you must be a huge hockey fan. Who I go, I don't have time. To, number one, I don't have time to watch hockey. The only thing I know about the NHL is from uh, the Elimination Cafe and from my <laughs> and, and from my son and from and from my son Michael. Those are the two. Those are the only and my and, and Arthur. Like any. So the, the greatest gift to, to to me to my kids was NHL twenty two. Right, I've learned more game. about hockey through that and through them. Um, that because I don't I just don't have time to watch NHL hockey games. Well, and, uh, look, let, so it's let, funny. I'm going to say this for you on your behalf. There is a big difference between being an NHL fan and a hockey fan, right? right? right. You're a hockey fan, right? Like I've I've never I look my business partner uh, doesn't watch the NHL at all. I mean, he couldn't tell you a few players on his own team in his own town, and they're in the Stanley Cup final. 
Right. Uh, but he loves the game though. So there is, there is a difference. My quick, quick bit of advice. Uh, when you start a segment saying, oh, I don't know if it's my number one passion, don't be in an office surrounded by hockey pucks, hockey sticks, hockey paraphernalia, and then be wearing a hockey jacket. I, I'm, I'm teasing you. Just, you you got to use my background. Right? Hockey sunglasses you got on there. You know, I got multiple sports behind me. Anyway, no, Mike, it's a beautiful story. Well, the other side, if I turn my, if I turn it around, the other side of my office is all fly fishing gear and, uh, you know. <laughs> yeah, but you didn't do that, Mike. You, you're looking at all the hockey stuff. No, no, listen, Look, my hockey, Mike is the hockey podcast here, so. Uh, <laughs> all right, so you love to fly fish. See, I didn't even know that. There you go. Right. Well, that's, that's, that's the whole connection to Norway. Right. And the whole, like I, I said, I got to have a hockey school in Norway so I could go f- salmon fishing. Love so if we can tie in, if we could, ta- if we could tie in hockey and anybody is listening, I, I love doing hockey schools in British Columbia, uh, anywhere <laughs> on the East coast, Massachusetts, Rhode There's Island, lake. uh, you know, <laughs> Maine, <laughs> Just, any, any, and during the striper season, uh, that's always yeah. the best time to be invited. Things like so that. you don't get to like Oklahoma much or, or Northern Texas. That's I'm not, not much buying that. sushi in Oklahoma <laughs> and I'm not, uh, you know, getting, uh, yeah, <laughs> I hope, yeah. but no, it's always, like Colorado. I'm always up for, for trout, but, uh, yeah, so I do, um, it, it, and it's funny because the hockey world as Christy knows, and as you know, through what you're doing, it's amazing. All the, you know, the, the, it's so cool. The people you meet and right. then how it branches <clears throat> off to like my things. I was in the, I was in the, uh, for six years, I, I was in the IT staffing business. Thought I'd try this. I was really fortunate to have an ex dad or, you know, my, one of my ex players, dad, who had a staffing company hired me sight unseen, basically like, like, you know, I don't know. You like to talk to people. You're good at customer service. Want to get involved in this industry, you know, get out of this, you know, getting just beat up from hockey parents all the time. So what ended up happening is I ended up being really successful in this. And it was every single one of my clients was a hockey person because I, who knew <laughs> I'm like, I, I, I said, who, who knew that's the head of American Express's IT department or who knew that was, you know, this guy is a Java developer. I wouldn't know this kind of stuff. So, you know, but it was really funny how the hockey, you know, because in the hockey world, you forget as a hockey person, everybody that's coming to your world. The only way they could afford to be there is to be not a hockey person. Right. You know, they have to be, they have to be in business and um, you know, and so it's really, it's really, and and this stuff comes up all the time when I talk to players now and I advise kids, high school kids that want to help. I'm like, do you know that the three volunteers that are out there doing the clinic own this, they own that, they own this, they own that be involved. I guarantee you when you send your resume to these people, they're going to get a second look and you're going to get on top of the pile. All those little things like that. You don't think about, you know, you think about, Oh, this guy, you know, I'm out here helping this guy's kid. No, no, you're out here. You're, this is a job interview. Every single, every time you step on the ice or step on the field or step on the diamond. And, you know, I, I really try to bring that perspective to, you know, all the things I do with the kids that it's not just about, and we've talked about this probably a number of times on, on, on and off the air is, you know, just all of these great different things that come into play outside of shooting a hockey puck. Right. And that's why yeah. we do it. Right. A, a couple of quick similarities between both your stories. One is that and you both said this and it's just so true. It, it's really the people you interact with more than even the game itself. Right. It's the connections you make along the way for your player. It's the, the guys or the girls in the locker room. I mean, that, that is something that it's tough during the journey to grasp, but as you move on, you start to realize how important those relationships are. Uh, Mike, the other thing too, that you both share this is that, you know, at times in your life, people say, you can't do this. There's, there's no future in this for you. Right. And, and that, that just with a smile, never stopped you. Just never stopped either. You said, like, oh, okay, yeah, I'm just going to do it anyway. <laughs> I love that about both. People of you. still ask me like, what do you do? Yeah. I go, oh, I do, I, I, I do some hockey advising and stuff. Yeah. But what do you do for like a yeah, living? Yeah, what do you do? I get that what all you, the time. I go, well, you, I don't you, make a living. You I make said, a I living guess. off of this? <laughs> I do. But how? I just wanted to. Uh, Mike, look, one more compliment. I'm going to pay you. Um, again things people don't know about you and this is again you and christy are very similar um you are so selfless in your approach right now don't get me wrong you're you're just like me you're a businessman you got to make a living right but you know i I have seen you on many occasions just do the right thing because you care about other people you care about these kids um you care about the their parents right You, you care even though they may not sometimes i'm not trying to make that negative um, and you just continue to do it. And, and just like Christy, Mike, you've affected a lot of lives that have affected other lives and have affected other lives. And, and you know, the, the ripple effect on the good work that you do and the type of person you are uh, is going to continue for a long time. Um, and, and again, it, 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 trying to keep this positive, while there are frustrating moments in hockey weekly, 
Um, we're lucky to have someone like you in the position that you're in. I really, really mean that, right? Because you're a beacon for people like me in a lot of ways. But, you know, I know that there are people that appreciate what you do. Even if, like you said, like in the Northeast, we throw compliments like sledgehammers. All right. So you might not get it a lot, but, but I, I've always in my, from the day I met you and I, I, you might not remember this, but I actually met Mike um, way well before this podcast uh, up in New Jersey at Bryce Salvador's training facility. And he just comes in with these floor ball sticks. Like we got, we got to get the kid. We got to get the kids use this. We got to get the kids. Use. They're good for their development. I remember thinking like, this guy's trying to sell floor ball sticks. He didn't sell a thing. You just try to get the kids to use the floor ball sticks. And like, we got to, this is going to grow the game. And um, I was like, wow, this, this guy's really into it. Um, and, and little did I know that three years later from that point, we'd be sitting here with, with uh, one of the most famous news anchors in the world uh, <laughs> doing this. Um, so that's all the time we have for today's episode. I want to thank you all for being here. <laughs> yeah, uh, you don't, how do you get off the hook? I don't understand. Uh, well, I host the show. I can do whatever. Yeah, yeah, right. No, no. Uh, I'm happy to turn this on myself now. Uh, but before we do, I, again, I want everybody listening. <clears throat> I, I, I deeply admire these two people that I co-host this show with. Uh, and I'm lucky fortunate blessed to share this airtime with you every week uh you always hear that statement you know you are who you hang out with i i i mean i'm so blessed i'm so blessed to be able to hang out with you two every week that's really how i look at it and 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 we've said it before like it's like uplifting for the week it's a it's a great way to start your monday right because nobody starts their monday feeling like yeah you know it's <laughs> you get out of bed yeah, it's I, like I, it's I, monday I, you know right. and, I, and i will say i mean you know before you go off on 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 uh you know my four uh, hour journey of all how your four, oh, but before you start talking which could be, <laughs> <clears throat> well but i think i think you know one of the things that is so great for us and i think i can speak for christy in, the, in this side too is really without you and caitlin and the, and the team that you have not only couldn't we do this logistically because you know i can't turn a mic on christy can't get her camera angle straight you know <laughs> i i I, we, we are, we're both like, you know, really so fortunate to have a professional team around this outside of what she does for as a profession and what I do for profession. And I think more importantly, the fact the stick to itness of it, like that, okay, well, Mike can't make it. We're going to go. Christy can't make it. We're going to go. Right. Uh, you know, we, we, the, the, this, this person is not available. We're going to have a program anyway. <laughs> right. And, and this kind of stuff is like, I don't think people really, you know, can appreciate how much goes into the pre in and post production of these kind of things that, you know, again, and, and, and no, you know, not for nothing. I, I love doing it. it is, it is therapy to me. It is a way for me to, you know, express a lot of things to the hockey world uh, that I, that I might not be able to get in a, a, on a Twitter post. Uh, but what it does is allows for me personally, because I know what, how this affects what I do. I get so much more interaction from people, good and bad, like negative and positive. Like, well, oh, you're full of crap. You know, you don't, you, you, you know, well, I'm like, yeah, I agree. Let's, let's, let's hear about it and let's talk about it and let's, and let's change the game in a positive way. And then let's fix, uh, you know, let's fix a lot of these things we can fix. And I, and I really do admire what your team has done you know, not only put this together, but keep it together. So yeah, well, it, it, it's a yeah. real tribute to and the I got to tell you, uh, Mike, I just, I love your honesty too. And is so much i don't know anybody who's smarter in hockey than you honestly you you have such incredible knowledge and you bring so much value to our podcast every week but two days ago somebody in the business with me said they wanted to start a podcast and they knew i i have a podcast right so they said so how do you do that? Can you, can you give it to me step by <laughs> yeah. step? Like, what do I need? How do I do it? How do I produce it? And I, I went, um, uh, You're just uh, talking to the I, mic, I, right? I it just hit record, right? Thing. I don't know. All I do is talk and it comes up on, uh, on, a, on a website. I don't know. You need a Kate. I'm your sorry. Life. I haven't a clue. They go, what do you mean? I see you every week. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know how to do it. Magic. Magic. Well, listen, no the answer clue. to that question is Caitlin. And, and I'll give Caitlin some It's kind of magical. We'll, we'll see if we can get Caitlin to come up here at the end of the episode to, to, to say hello to everybody, because this really is a four person team, whether people realize it or not. We're just the ones on the air. But, uh, no, Mike, I appreciate you bringing that up because there is a lot that goes into to making these possible. And uh, the one thing you said I want to tap on is that I'm a, I'm a big believer in discussion based learning. 
right? Uh, like while, while teaching and coaching are extremely valuable, uh, I think when people have discussions, even if they disagree, more learning comes out of that than just someone saying in 1776, you know, this happened, you know what I mean? Um, so, and I think that, that the purpose of the show, you know, while, while we're all experts in our own right, uh, we've always opened it up for the audience of, hey, look, this is just what we think. We, you know, feel free yeah. to chime in. And, yeah, and we don't always agree. Yeah. Uh, I'll go back to the uniform episode right. anyway. <laughs> well, we, well, we won't them. talk about that. We, we fly fish them over. What I love one. about this is we have, we come with different experiences right. and we're honest about it. Yeah, yeah, and, and, and we find that a lot. There is a trust here uh, that's been yeah. a, a, since moment one that has existed, and 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 will continue to. Okay, so listen for me, Christy. Do you want me to dive into it, or do you want to turn into interviewer <clears throat> and ask questions? Because that's Let's usually where questions. you're, what do you you're think, most Mike? comfortable. We'll ask some questions. Yeah, like questions yes. is better because then we can we can contain okay. him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> Hour five. My fifth year of life. <laughs> no, no, go ahead. I want to give you guys three. Yeah, yeah. Run on the next five Saturdays. <laughs> twelve Saturday. part series. <laughs> go ahead, Christy. You're the you're the you're the professional. Open it up. All right. So, we just just tell us about your family because I know you love talking about them. I do your I wife do. and your two kids? And this last season, you sat out as a coach. Which yeah, I'm was about to. Enough. Yeah. So so. Uh, Look, if anybody asks me what I do, the first thing I always say is I'm a father first to my my two children, Logan and Alina, and I'm a husband to my wife, Janet, uh, after that. And my, my wife, who's a hero uh, to me and many other people, is a, is a physician here in Philadelphia um, and really led the COVID response for the city um, from a university level. So uh, I've always been, <clears throat> like I would say this, I'm six feet tall, about 5'11", eleven, six foot, but I look up to my five foot two wife all, every day. <laughs> Um, but, you know, I was actually born and raised uh, in Philadelphia, right outside in the, 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 the early suburbs um, uh, by my mother, Evelyn, and my father, Edward, who uh, were the greatest role models you could have, and my big brother, Alan. Uh, and look, I was really blessed that uh, both of my parents had steady work growing up. Um, they taught me the value of work. Uh, you know, I always talk about my father telling me about the time he got a job as a young kid. I think he started working when he was 12 years old or 13 years old, and the pride about having a job really stuck with me. Um, and that helped to develop a work ethic in me of just, you know, valuing work, I guess, in a lot of ways. And then my big brother uh, <clears throat> always led from the front. He hates when I talk about it, but I was always watching my brother's five years older than me. And he would do things like, you know, go on stage and do debate and he would try track and he would try all these things. And I just naturally, well, if he, if he goes on stage, I got to try and do that. I got to be a public speaker. Uh, broadcaster at some point. Well, if he's playing sports, I got to do that, right? If he's getting great grades in college, well, I got to do that, right? So I, I always feel like there was uh, a divine influence of somebody showing me a path, if you will, right? Um, and now that I'm older, I'm starting to realize that the people that did that, maybe they didn't have a path, <laughs> right? They figured it out and paved the way for me. Uh, and I'm always thankful for that. And I'm trying to do that for my my children and my family now. But um it really, even going back to my grandparents, like I said, I'm, I'm going to cap it or else I'll beat her for six hours. But my, uh, my, my, my grandparents, my grandmother came from another country. Um, and you know, her, her, it took a year for her to trek across Europe to get to North America. And I remember her telling me that story growing up. So that's the basis I've had of the incredible struggle. Uh, you know, I have no problem admitting this, you know, I'm a Jewish household. So, you know, we learn a lot about history in a household like that. Um, and, those were the people that shaped me, you know, a value on family, a value on work, a value on identity and survival, uh, and a real anchor of, <clears throat> you know, how bad it could be. Um, you know, uh, my grandmother didn't have lots of food on both sides. Actually, my grandparents, you know, my father grew up in poverty. Uh, so I've always tried to have an anchor of, wow, hey, I love psychogenesis, but my, my you know, we got three meals a day. I, 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 as, especially as I've gotten older, I've realized that, but again, Christy to anchor it, that's kind of the basis I started from even before I was in the game. Yeah, that's awesome. And I think, I think we, I think knowing that about you, right. Really helps to, to helps to kind of frame, you know, how a lot of your, your empathy comes from and a lot of your, obviously your passion and, and your, thankfulness and, and you hear that in everything you do like I and I know like on the outside of this in the business world and we, when we do things together and we collaborate on different 
pieces. It's not all about, you, you know, and I don't want to say it's because it's not greed. It's about, okay, well, what, what can we do here? How can we make this work? And what right. in, in this circumstance, <clears throat> what's the best way to approach this? And, you know, there's no upselling. There's no like, oh, well, if you, if you like this, you're really going to like this. Right. Like, and I think, and I think that's, <laughs> and I think that's so important because of the fact that, you know, we're in an industry and we're, we're, you know, that we could forget that not everybody has the means to buy a brand new pair of skates every five months. Right. And, you know, like me, I never had a, I didn't have a brand new pair of skates until I played college hockey, like ever. Like I'm right. like, Oh my God, this is unbelievable. Like this happens. <laughs> like who, who can get this? You know? So I think it's uh, and my, my younger brothers and sisters never had skates. Cause they're always, you know, they're, they're, you know, coming up from behind you. But I guess my, I guess my real question then would be to you from that, from your, from, from where you came and we know a little bit about your hockey history and, and how you, you know, how you overcame a lot of adversity as a player, but then what was the, what was the, the piece that really kind of said to you, well, you know what? I think I could put all these different pieces together right. and, and be in the hockey world. And I think, you know, outside of the, the motivational speaking you do, and, and you could, and I'd love you to talk about, you know, your book series and the things you do on that side, because I use those books all the time as references to other, other people I coach and work with, but maybe just how did you even get into the piece of the industry you're in now right? Uh, where you're actually selling hockey products? You know, I, I am going to try and, give that answer. There's, there's multiple points and you have my word. I won't go for six hours on this. Okay. Uh, it's the people I was around that triggered me into that. My mother, who was a nurse for, for, you know, 40 years, um, Christy, similar to you, like, you know, she was a leader and that, that wasn't exactly something in, in her younger years that was normalized as, as a female leader. So I always had these strong female characters in my life, people in my life. Right. And that my, my father and my mother and my brother, they, they did the work and got what they wanted, right? And I remember, and there's like three touch points here, Mike. I remember when I was about 12 years old, 11, 12 years old, and uh, roller hockey was really popular. And I was outside, and I turned to the kid I was playing with, his neighbor, and I said to him, hey, do you think we can make the NHL, right? And he said, no, there's no way. Of course not. <laughs> and I just remember thinking this. I remember thinking, and I, and I, I didn't make the NHL as a player. I'll get to that in a minute, but I remember thinking, but someone's got to make it. That was where my mind went. Right. And I'm realizing now that, you know, his mind went and there's nothing wrong with it. I, I, he's probably told this, but his mind went like, there's no point. And my mind went, but somebody's got to make it. That was taught to me by those influences I talked about earlier of, well, someone's got to try. Right. Um, and that started my belief as a player of I'm going to be a pro hockey player. <laughs> That's where that came from. Right. Um, and again, you can look that stuff up. I mean, I went very far in the game and eventually I was not good enough to make the NHL, but in high school, I found, uh, outside, you know, people, the second great love of my life, which is broadcasting. And Christy, similar to you, I got on the radio and I just knew first time I, I skated. I knew first time I played hockey. I knew I was like, this is something yeah. special, right? The first time yeah. I got on the mic, I said, wow, this is something <laughs> special. And I, I have to say this to everybody. I am so lucky. I really mean this, that I have two professional loves in my life in broadcasting and hockey. Some people don't get any. All right. So I am, I am so thankful. I was able to find two passions in that realm. Uh, so what did I do? I went to my high school radio station. I had a hockey show, <laughs> an NHL hockey show. Um, and then I realized at that point, Mike, I can go to college for this. I can go to college for broadcasting. Uh, uh, Christy went to Syracuse, which is by far the best broadcasting school in the country. Um, I ended up at, Mike, you mentioned this earlier, Montclair State University in New Jersey, who also had a really great broadcasting school. Yeah. And I was playing college hockey up there. I um, mean, towards the end of my college career, it was pretty obvious. You know, I, I had some minor league looks, but I realized that this, this might be it. Um, but I started working in broadcasting and eventually got a job at the NHL, right, uh, with the NHL Network. And I realized, you know, I joke, but it's kind of true. Hey, I made it. <laughs> I made it to the NHL. I was working at NHL headquarters in New York City. I'm doing uh, NHL live broadcasts. Um, and it was around that time, Mike, that uh, my college team, Montclair State University, had no coach. And I was 22 years old. And I volunteered to be the head coach of that team. And I remember the administrators mm -hmm. thought I was crazy. They said, why would you want to do this? You're 22. You should be partying, which is absolutely not what you should be doing at 22, by the way, for those of you listening. 
Uh, I dove in and we turned a team that was five and 25 before I took over into a team that was 25 and five. We did that together. And that's when I realized there's something here. <laughs> like, wow, I, 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 I'm, I'm good at this. And collectively as a team, and Mike, you know where that's going, we were able to accomplish something that everyone said we were not able to accomplish. Like everyone said, this team's going to go under. Um, and so I started to identify through this. I'm a great coach and I work at the NHL and that was wonderful until all of my, my life fell apart at 26 or 27, where I lost everything that I had really by no fault of my own, right? My job at the NHL and my job at coaching were gone within a month. Uh, one of them at the NHL, it was the recession. My position was terminated. The NHL network was launched. They didn't need me anymore. I will, I've said this before. I've, I will always be thankful in my exit interview that they said to me, you didn't do anything wrong. <laughs> I will, looking back on that now as an adult, I, I would have dwelled on that forever. Um, and then uh, the college team, it was time to move on. And what happened was uh, I had nothing left. And it was at that moment I realized, you know what you have? I have my girlfriend at the time, Janet, who's my wife now. Uh, my mom and my dad and my brother were there for me. That was the moment, Mike, a uh, real trigger moment in my life that I stopped identifying as a person in hockey. That was not my identity. I was, I'm just a family person. And, uh, you know, I'm like, going to identify differently. And that was the moment, probably the modern version of myself was born. And I realized I don't need to do this. I choose to do this. And from there, I set on a journey of, I want to inspire teams and I want to inspire people. And my wife joined the air force and I traveled all over the world and I got to do hockey everywhere, leading to professional teams and professional championships. And this belief now that I was put here to help other people and to share stories um, but I had to go through all of that stuff, which, by the way, as I said earlier, minimal suffering compared to what my 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 parents and my my grandparents went through, but suffering right. nonetheless, right? Well, let's hit the pause button for a moment because a lot yeah. of people might be going through that at this very moment. Sure, you have this sure. major earthquake in your life, and you think this is horrible. Oh, it hurt. I have it no bad. future. I'm, and you're depressed and you're upset and you think it's never going to get better. But sometimes you just have to have a little bit of faith. Right. Because sometimes those earthquakes are necessary in our life because you know what happens is there's a reformation. Right. And it kind of like there's this huge upheaval and it puts you on a different path that you never would have seen and never would have experienced had that earthquake not taken place. So I always tell people that when they go through those tumultuous times in their life, that there's, and it's, I know it sounds cliche, but sometimes there is a reason for that because that's not where you're meant to be. Right. You're meant to be someplace else. And that's well, a really good lesson for people to learn. And you well, experienced that. Yeah, I'll tell you a couple of things about that time period because it. Well, I was very depressed. <laughs> Look, I was very fortunate. I had, again, my parents and my, and, and my wife, my future wife at the time and my brother. Um, some people don't have anybody at those times. Uh, it's always important for everybody listening that you try and be that person if someone's really in need. All right? you, we underestimate how important we are to each other. Um, but you know what changed really at that time, and this is the thing I think I realized, Christy, aside from the identity, was that uh, I was so focused on getting to the top before that. I have to get to the top to the point. I wasn't even like thinking, wow, you're at the NHL, your college coach at this 20 early. Tw like, I had no concept of like, wow, you're really doing well, man. <laughs> right. It was just got to get to the top. And when I fell from that mountain, you know, my father gave me this great advice because I was really ready to just kind of give up on things. And he said, you know, just take a step, just take the next step, you know, fight for what you need to do, but just take a step. Stop trying to see 10 miles ahead and just take the next step. And after you take that step, take another step. And I really had to slow down and get started. This is where I started learning about present moment awareness, which I'm not going to give a whole speech on right now, but I live my life like that now. In fact, I, I think I told this story. Uh, I was recently in England coaching pro again. And this guy said, well, what's your goal? Where do you want to be? He was younger, right? And I said, I just want to be right here right now. He's like, no, I know, but what's your long-term goal? You want to coach in the NHL? I said, my long-term goal. He goes, yeah. I said, I just want to be right here right now. And I had to try to explain that to him. Like, that's my goal constantly is to be present. Right. And you know, what's funny about it, Christy, Mike, the rest kind of take care of it, takes care of itself. Yeah. I found just as much success doing that, probably more than when I didn't do that. Right. Uh, right. And enjoying the journey. But yeah, look, 
it was a great quote of, if you're in the darkness, can you see the next step in front of you and just take that step? You don't have to figure the entire future out right now, especially when you're depressed. It's, it's, it's not going to materialize. <laughs> just take a step. You will get out of it. Right. And I did. And, and uh, I've been thankful every day for that collapse, Christy, every day, that earthquake you talk about, it was a massive life change. I'm thankful for it every single day. Right. Cause I would not have been on this path without it. Um, and then Mike, like you said, as you, you do too, I've been very fortunate to create hockey businesses. Again, we're not plugging things today, but I have a global hockey company. I have an upcoming hockey company. I get to coach through my hockey companies. So I've, I've, I've been put in a position where I'm able to use hockey as a conduit to help other people, which is really my passion and broadcasting. So it eventually came to that point anyway. Um, I, I do want to say this though, because, and, and this is true, Christy, of you and Mike and myself, <clears throat> the love we have for the game, just use that terminology right now, broadcasting um, is uncommon. Now, everybody says they love the game and, and people do on different levels, but I I mean, this is a life passion of mine, all right? I love hockey. I love it. And I love that I get to use it, as I said, as a conduit to help others. That's the blessing, right? I don't need to be an NHL coach to do that, right? Or a player, going back to what I said when I was 12, right? And I feel like, you know, that's the gift, right? And, and I'm okay with that. I don't look at myself as a failure. A like 12-year-old me might, but I'm not 12. Right. So, so that, that's my point is just enjoying the journey and being along the way. And Mike, like you said, like, I'm so driven to help people. I just want, I, especially now, you know, whether it's mental fitness or my work in mental fitness or the books I've wrote, they're, they're all done with an intention of helping other people. And if I get to make a living doing that, right, I don't need to be a billionaire. I don't. Right. I just, I, I get to make a living helping people and making people feel good. That's really where I'm at. If that's wishy-washy, that's fine. This is my journey. <laughs> right. right. That's what I get to do. Again, for those of you who don't know, this is actually a four-person team. You see the three of us. There she is. There we go. This is Caitlin Reese, our producer, our community manager. Every time you see an episode, a clip, literally she did it. She had she has a hand in it. Uh, but but Caitlin, I wanted to bring you on today. I, I again, this is why I didn't tell you about what we were doing today, because uh your passion for this is 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 equal to all of us. But uh I wanted you all to meet her, see her. And again, she's blushing too. I'm sorry. But, <laughs> and if you're seeing a, a, a cat tail on your video, we have an office cat here in Philadelphia. So there's actually five members of this team, uh, Roy, the cat. But Caitlin, why don't you tell everybody? Cause you've had a unique journey into this game as well. Yeah. Um, so I wasn't a hockey fan at all growing up. Um, I found the game <laughs> super late in life. Um, what we call my rebirth um, at the age of 20. Um, and you know, a couple years later, I found myself working in the game. Um, and it's just been fantastic since. Um, my best friend brought me to my first hockey game. And from there, um, that's really everything. Um, I went to school to teach. And I had a passion for creating things. Um, I, went, I, I uh, did broadcast in high school. And um, here I am. Yeah, I'm going to say something about you, Caitlin. Caitlin has done something this last year that 99.9% .9 of you have not done in hockey, including myself. <laughs> Caitlin went to every single, all 41 home games last year for her, her local professional sports team. That is the Philadelphia Flyers. And she did this in literally the worst season the Flyers have ever had. You want to talk about dedication. Let me tell you something. When we got to game 32, Caitlin, even you were starting to go like, oh, I've got a game tonight. <laughs> I got to go see the Flyers yeah. tonight. <laughs> but she loves this game and she loves the team so much. And, and I've said to her before, uh, and I, I, I think it's important for everybody to hear this. Uh, how many years you've been in hockey, Caitlin? Like three, four? Uh, coming up on five. Five years. All right. Uh, so easy for people to look at. You're not a real hockey person. You've only been doing it five years. Her passion is matched if not beyond my passion for this game within five it doesn't matter how long you've been doing it that's the point i'm trying to make one year five years 50 years the point is she's in it she's invaluable and she's contributing to the game not just through this podcast right through all of the work that we do i've said this before i'm sorry if i'm making blush but she is so invaluable to our team and we hope you make you we make you feel that way <laughs> right that that we could not be doing any of this without her, right 
Uh, and above all, she's a great human being and a great person, uh, you know, beyond belief. I mean, she's helped my family went, went without me asking. I mean, there's so many things I could say about you, Caitlin, but uh, Caitlin, we had to bring you up here and, and tell everybody about you. I appreciate it. Okay. You can go to your camera <laughs> if you want, or you can okay. stay on here. I should say, Mike, Christy, do you have any questions for Caitlin? I, well, I, I, I'm not giving it, I'm not going to mention Gritty, but uh... <laughs> he's behind you. No, but I think I, I, I've got to know Caitlin a little bit on, on her on her remote treks and, and, and the stuff she does behind the scenes. Real professional, um, you know, passionate. And you wouldn't know you were only involved in hockey in a couple of years. And I think that's irrelevant to what, uh, you know, your your knowledge of the game or, you know, background of power plays and, and uh, you know, player development is irrelevant to a lot of the stuff that you do only because, you know, you bring you can see in your work outside of the podcast, but all the other stuff you do that you capture, you're capturing hockey, you're capturing the, 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 the passion and the, and the, and the craziness, right. Of being a fan. And, and, uh, and I love that. I think it's great. So we, and we, and I'll speak for me. I really appreciate what you do here. Cause you keep it um, again, like to Christie's point, like if somebody says, Oh yeah, well, how do you do that? I'd like, I'd love a, a crash course on podcasting. I'm like, I have no idea how I do it. I, all I know is, I, all, we have all I know is, I think the computer turned on correctly, yeah. and I was in good shape. So, we have a Caitlin. Yeah, I appreciate Caitlin. That, you're you're you. just so much fun to be around too. We had you, when you guys came up to Syracuse for the book signing, we had a ball, and I was really excited because she's a huge fan of Irish culture, shall we say. <laughs> In Syracuse, we are the home of the only traffic light where the green <laughs> is on top. And I didn't tell her where I was bringing her. It's up on Tip Hill. And I brought you guys there and I pointed to the light and your eyes just lit up <laughs> as big as that traffic light. It was so exciting to do that. Was that was so cool. <laughs> Caitlin's happy in hockey rinks and in Irish culture. That's 100% accurate. I met I met Caitlin, yeah. again, a very quick one. Uh, I met Caitlin at an Irish festival that was across the street from my house. She runs up to me. First time I ever met, she goes, are you Lee from Elimination Cafe? I couldn't believe it. And my wife looked at me and she says, ball, beep. I can't say it out loud on the show. And I said, what's your name? Caitlin. Caitlin, nice to meet you. What do you do? I'm a photographer. You know, we're always looking for photographers. That's, that's how we met. Uh, and I, again, addendum to the story about all the Flyers games. She went there as a photographer. She didn't pay for tickets. She was there working. Okay. So the next time you meet someone, so I've only done the game a couple of years. Don't judge right away. All right. She's done right. something I've never done in the game. And, uh, and again, Caitlin, you'll, I always joke with her friends listening. Yes. You will always have that in your back pocket. Yeah. But did you go see the flyers during the worst season ever, every single home game? Uh, Cause she did. All right. That's, that's I actually, that's, I drove from Syracuse to Philly. You did, you to, did. to go to the game uh, <laughs> against Toronto too. That, that's the funny thing about it. But yeah. Uh, yeah, and, and again, building on the episode, she doesn't identify that way. It was just something she did. It was a bucket list checkbox and, and yeah. uh, an incredible human being that also cares about other people an immense amount, which is probably the common theme, I'm guessing, between the four of us now is, is that we just we just tend to want to help other people, uh, servant leaders. And for those of you listening, again, uh, obviously, we can't put all of you on the mic, but we appreciate you, too. If you're listening to this show, you obviously have some sort of common bond with what we're talking about. Um, and we really do really from the bottom of our hearts appreciate that the fact that you invite us into your cars and your iPhones and, and whatever you're listening to or watching this on, uh, and the trust that we've earned to just talk to you is, is big. And, and, and the amount of emails and the comments we get of just, wow, somebody else went through that, or I, I feel you on this, uh, or I love your show. Uh, it's why we do it every week. It's why we do it every single week. And, and we share all those with the group, but uh, that concludes, I think, this is your life edition of Our Kids Play Hockey. But uh, I want to thank uh, the three of you, really, for doing this. I did not tell them the topic today. I put them all on the spot. And um, again, I'm far enough away from most of you that you can't throw something at me. Um, and Caitlin's office door is shut right now, so that's not going to be biting me in the butt anytime soon. Uh, again, if you have any questions about any of us or anything we talk about in the shows, or you have a topic idea, feel free to reach out to us at team at ourkidsplayhockey.com or visit our website, ourkidsplayhockey.com or our Facebook page, Our Kids. You get the point. We're everywhere. Just search for Our Kids Play Hockey and we'll show up. But uh, for Christy Casciano, Burns, Mike Benelli, and Caitlin Reese making your debut, I'm Lee Elias. Thanks for listening to this edition of our show, and we'll see you next week.
We hope you enjoyed this edition of Our Kids Play Hockey. Make sure to like and subscribe right now if you found value wherever you're listening, whether it's a podcast network, a social media network, or our website, ourkidsplayhockey.com. Also, make sure to check out our children's book, When Hockey Stops, at whenhockeystops.com. It's a book that helps children deal with adversity in the game and in life. We're very proud of it. But thanks so much for listening to this edition of Our Kids Play Hockey, and we'll see you on the next episode.